Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending November 12, 2016. First up, this is from the Daily Dot. The Sega Genesis is officially back in production. Uh, before I start reading the article, I found out that there's very limited amounts going to stores. A friend of mine named Sean that works at uh, Walmart said that the stores are getting like 10 units each, so uh, this might end up being one of those major aggravations come Christmas time. It says here, uh, I'll start reading the article, Sega may be done making the Genesis known as Mega Drive outside of the U.S., but that doesn't mean people aren't still buying them in Brazil. The 16-bit system is still hugely popular, and now it's being brought back into production. Um, let me make another comment, too. I've heard some people say, I've never seen one, I don't know, and I don't have uh, anybody giving a full-on review of it, but uh, they say it's still not identical to the original um, Genesis, but uh, that I don't know. Tech Toy, which produced all manner of gadgets and toys, has launched pre-orders for all new Sega Mega Drive stock, complete with support for the original game library and controllers. But what's even more astounding about the announcement is that it's all being done with Sega's blessing, making these official, brand new Sega branded consoles. The new consoles are spinning images of the originals, aside from the addition of an SD card slot, which makes it great for emulation. They're even complete with support for AV cables, although there's no HDMI or other bells and whistles that may seem like a bad move but for the Brazilian market it's a perfect fit not to mention you can easily pick up an AV to HDMI converter I think even most HDMI capable TVs have a video uh, and audio input on it anyway so I don't really see that as being any kind of a, a deal breaker uh, pre-orders for the system are currently priced at uh, what is it, $125 in the U.S.? I heard something that it was $60 if you bought the first, but, you know, it's it's a make-believe price anyway. You can know, call it anything if you only have 10 per store. So let's call it $125. I actually thought when the original, I remember uh, the original Sega Genesis console, which I think after I got um, at least one, maybe two different Atari consoles, I did get the Sega Genesis uh, console, and I thought it was really good for the time. I thought it was, well, in fact, it was for the fun of the gameplay, the graphics and everything like that. I think it was kind of for a while ahead of the rest of them, but then, uh, oh well. We'll see what happens. Next up, a uh, key meeting to weigh Mars crash report. I've been reporting about this too. You know, obviously, the European Space Agency, along with Russia, were going to uh, land a probe on Mars and end up being a crash rather than, uh, um, you know, an, a soft landing. So. It says here, engineers are close to identify. This is from BBC.com, by the way. All the links will be to all the articles will be down below in the description. The European Space Agency's Director General said he expected to have at least an interim report for member states when they meet to discuss future plans for a fortnight's time. That's two weeks. Attention is focused on how the probe interpreted sensor readings during its ill-fated descent to the Red Planet. Schiaparelli's parachute and rocket system did not behave as expected. Yeah, kid, no kidding. The form was jettisoned too early and the latter fired too short a period. So yeah, basically it plowed into the ground. The onboard computer had some problems taking data from different sources and defining correctly the altitude and because of that the engines were started for only three seconds, which is not enough. When the parachute was deployed it worked, but then some acceleration happened and that we do not understand. Was it that the parachute did not deploy fully? We do not know. So they're still reviewing the telemetry, but the main thing that they're talking about and they're discussing and it says here at the end of the article, but the big issue facing it now is shortage of cash because this was supposed to be the mission that um, was the prelude to a rover actually going to, but they're going to need some money, you know, and when you have this to show for your test run and you're asking member states to put up, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of euros um, to build and operate the launch, uh, the launch and the hopefully successful operation of the rover, I don't know. It says they have already delayed the life-seeking robot several times, and there's a feeling now that unless its future is totally resolved, the project could well be binned. Mr. Warner said, I guess he's one of the head of it, he wanted to see an un unequivocal commitment to plug the outstanding funds and an end to the piecemeal of salami support that has sustained rover development to date. Full transparency is necessary and it only takes makes sense for member states to commit the whole amount. Um, yeah, but still, I mean... I would probably say that most member states would be more than willing to commit, well, more willing to commit for another test run before you uh, put the whole money in and stuff like that and see if you can even successfully land something smaller, I mean, and have everything work out right. I mean, to put even more eggs in the basket, so to say, just to have them possibly plow into the ground again. I mean, like they say, it's, you know, the United States has had several, but even we've had our splats too, and it's a, it's a, about a 50-50 proposition that you're going to get anything useful out of a... a a landing on Mars, so 
you got to be careful and you got to be well aware that people don't want to spend money on that kind of thing. So we shall see and I will keep you updated too. This is something a little bit about, I've been talking about self-driving trucks, cars, uh, vans, all that kind of stuff. Um, well, this is a little bit uh, going back in time. This is sent to me by Bob Hightower. Carnegie Mellon's 1986 self-driving van was adorable. Um, I don't know. It, I don't know if you call it adorable. It was just a, a, a full-size blue van with a lot of uh, boxes on it and stuff. But it says, computer scientists have been at the self-driving vehicle problem for longer than you might think. Early research into the automated logic required for autonomous cars was published in the mid-70s, while the first fully robotic van came around in the early 80s. Courtesy of Ernst Dickmans and the team at Bundhauser, no, Bundes, Bundeswehr and University of Munich. Efforts at Carnegie Mellon, meanwhile, were pushing the technology on the other side of the Atlantic. First came Terragator in 1983. Looks like a little six wheeled, uh, I don't know, sport vehicle, something like that. Um, yeah, it's pretty quaint, but machine vision algorithms in particular were still young. In 1989, Carnegie Mellon pioneered a neural network called Alvin. I think I remember that that could be employed in road following tax and certain tasks in certain field conditions that use machine learning to watch human drivers and adapt its strategies. Um, these were all though and very much uh, they did not let them out to just drive wherever. These were very much under controlled condition and closed courses and uh, a lot of repeatability and stuff like that. But if you want to kind of see where self-driving cars have come from and I mean it's it seems like they're about 90 percent of the way there. They still need a little bit of adjustments. This is kind of more like when they were about 50 percent there I guess I would say if I'd want to hazard a guess but yeah check that out from motherboard.vice.com and last up this is from popular science and uh, some of you have seen the self-cleaning uh, lasers used to clean metals and stuff like that people have been posting that all over I'm not sure if it was on the dumpster diver page too but I've been seeing that all over where laser cleaning of surfaces and you can even hold your hand in front of the laser and the laser will go over your hand and not hurt it but then it'll if there's rusty metal right next to it it'll clean the rusty metal off well Laser blasted metal forms a self-cleaning non-stick surface. The technique could make faster vehicles and improve sanitation in the developing world. Yeah, the thing is it changes the actual metallic structure itself. Um, water, the key life on our planet, can sometimes be one of our greatest enemies, especially when it comes to its interactions with metals, air, moisture triggers the formation of rust and corrosion of metal surfaces, while frozen water can render some metals temporarily worthless. I.g. Uh, IC airplane wing. Yeah, that's the other thing too. They're thinking about using this to treat a surface so it would be so hydrophilic that uh well you can actually see on the on the video here down below I'll see if they'll actually let me uh, without giving me a copyright ding on this lately I've been doing that but I'll try to play just a few seconds of the video here where you can see the water droplets just touching this treated metal surface they just totally bounce away I mean it's like they're just um, it seems to me to be even better than a Teflon coating so it says uh, the guy in charge says this method of turning metals hydrophobic is superior to chemical coatings like Teflon in a couple of ways First of all, these laser-generated metals repair water, repel water way better than any type of coat available. With a Teflon-coated metal surface such as your average non-stick frying pan, it requires a tilt of 70 degrees to get rid of the surface of any water. With these laser-enhanced metals, an angle of just 5 degrees is sufficient for water to slide off. So super, super slick. And a lot of people too, like it says in the article here, people are concerned about the health problems because as the Teflon wears away on the pans, obviously some of it's getting into the food and being consumed. Um, not that it seems like anything's wrong with Teflon. I mean, we even have Teflon implants in our bodies, a lot of us, if we've had operations and surgery and stuff like that. But it says the research, the research, I can almost talk today. The research team envisions a number of applications for these metal materials beyond making it easier to cook scrambled eggs. The metals are non-corrosive, remaining sturdier for longer periods of time, and they yield a number of transportation benefits, ensuring that ice never forms on a car or airplane wing. Even ships can become faster, and that would be the other thing, too. If you can really slick in the bottom of these ships, too, especially um, cargo ships, you might not, over each mile, save a heck of a lot, just a tiny amount, but when you figure crossing a whole ocean, even if you save a couple of gallons every mile, pretty soon by the time you cross the ocean, you might only need maybe, you know, 20% less of the fuel that what you needed without it. So they can reduce water friction and drag on the sea. But uh, it says, Go is excited about the metals application in the developing world. Hydrophobic metals can stay cleaner for much longer without requiring a lot of water to wash away dirt. Yeah, places where clean water is a very, very precious resource, it would be kind of nice to just kind of dab it with a wet towel and uh, wipe it off and things like that. So anyway, thank you, Bob, for the article. And thank you, everybody, that's been sending in articles for the past few weeks. I really appreciate it a lot. And those people that keep on posting on the Facebook page, too, for the dumpster divers. So take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.